Lecture one, making sense of data. This lecture is going to start off the process of looking at how we acquire data and how we make sense of it. It's pretty simple stuff to begin with. You'll be familiar with it from GCSE, A-level and so on, but it's going to start our building process to understand the ideas that will go a bit further than this. We have a process and we want to understand how to build it, how to design it, how to optimize it. All these things are what engineers do. And we need to come up with numbers to represent every part of it. And what we find is that those numbers are never the same twice. If you measure something one day and measure it again, the two measurements will always be a bit different. There are elements of chance, of random occurrences, which make it different each time. And so the starting point for making sense of data is to combine an understanding of how an experiment is performed, how random effects contribute to the measurements we take, and how we take that complete picture to come up with a representation that we can use. To start with, we look at center and spread of data, and then we look at outliers. Here's an experiment. This experiment is to measure the strength of metal. Here's our metal sample piece, and it's going to be pulled between these two clamps uh, the clamps measure the uh, displacement moved and the force and we want to know how strong it is. We want to design a pressure vessel for example and we don't want it to burst so we know the pressure of the gas or liquid inside the vessel and so we can work out the stress on the metal and then we need to make sure that the failure stress of that metal is a good deal higher than the predicted process stress. So what happens is the machine starts to pull apart and the force that it measures goes up. You can see the head moving, starts to stretch the sample. Force keeps on going up and then you can see it necking and finally it fails. And this really is the starting point for understanding how to build something out of metal. Uh, you notice two distinct things happening. The necking, that was the point at which the material started to stretch out, and we would call that a yield point. That's the point where the material yields and starts to flow. And then the second key point was where it uh, snapped. We call that the failure point. And uh, so there are two particular things. We're going to focus on the failure point of the metal here. Now, as we said, you do the same thing twice, you get a different value. This test has been done 14 times in this case and we call n equals 14, that's the number of measurements. And you look at those numbers and they're different. Sometimes they're the same, but uh, that's because they've all been rounded to two significant figures. So first of all, we recognize there's a limitation to the accuracy of the machine and what we're measuring, uh, and there's no point recording data that is of no meaning. And so we've restricted our measurements to two significant figures. That means we have one, two figures that are numeric and all the other ones are zero, and we've rounded it to the nearest value in the tens column. So we have two significant figures and sometimes uh, they're the same but uh, you can see there's a big spread of data. The starting point is put these in order from lowest to highest like so and then we can start to look at them and uh, think about how we can represent what the material is doing. It's a case where we have a population and a sample. The population is all of the measurements that you could do uh, of material samples for this metal. Obviously that's an infinite number uh, and it doesn't exist yet, it's a population that could be produced, so it's kind of like a, a theoretical idea. But what we are doing is taking a sample of it. We've taken a sample from 14 different metal sample pieces uh, and tested each one separately. So we have the conception that there's a, a number that we want uh, and the sample that we have. And the number that we want is the strength of this metal. But of course, the metal is not always the same when it's manufactured. It changes from time and place. And so what we really want is to know what the middle value of that is, what the mean or average value of this metal strength is, and then how much it might be expected to vary around that mean typically. So that's what we would like to know. And then what we've got is our sample, which is 14 measurements of it. The variation in these measurements, well, partly it will be due to the variation in the actual sample, and partly it will be due to new errors and new variation that's been introduced by our 
experimental method and by our measurement techniques. So let's start by taking our ordered data and finding some simple parameters from it. First of all, the center. With 14 data points, the center lies between two of them. And so we call this the median value, it's the middle value. And when there are two of them, of course, you must take the mean of those two to give our median value. The data extends around that median. So the simplest measurement of that is the range. That's the largest value minus the smallest value. And here we have a range of 210 megapascals. The range obviously extends from the highest to the lowest and whatever the highest is and whatever the lowest is, is a little bit arbitrary, a bit random. Less random is the interquartile range. This represents the middle 50% of the data points. And uh, you'll have encountered this at A-level, I'm sure. You might not know that there's actually a number of different ways of finding the quartiles. I'll just take a look on Wikipedia to give you a bit of an impression of uh, what people have done before. So each of these methods is based on something that a, a Wikipedia author has found. This is how the TI-83 calculator does it. Uh, this is done, um, another method present, promoted by somebody. Um, they're not right, they're not wrong, they're just different ways of doing it. There's some ambiguity when you're trying to find where the 25% um, quartiles are. We're gonna use method one, very simple. It means divide the data into two halves around the median and then find the median of each of those halves. So we'll see how we do that. Our median was here between seven and eight. So we've taken that half of the data and then we find the median of that again. Uh, with seven data points, the median is the middle one. So it's 840 megapascals for our lower quartile. And then likewise, our upper quartile is 890 pascals like that. So then we find the interquartile range is 50 megapascals. And that's a really useful thing because that is going to be much more consistent from one batch of 14 experiments to the next. The maximum and minimum data points that are measured are going to vary each time, uh, but this is going to be more consistent. So already we've got a middle value, the median, we've got the interquartile range, and this is starting to present a, a picture um, of what we'd expect the actual material property to be, property to be and less dependent on the uh, particular sample that we've taken. And the median, also sometimes that's called the middle, quart middle quartile, because 25% of the data here, 25% of the data here, and so on. Okay, so outliers. So we're talking about the data set, and we've started to think about it, started to recognize actually the limits of that might be a bit arbitrary from one set of data to the next. Uh, so we're introducing the idea of outliers. This is some... Um, sample data, measurements of somebody, uh, a group of people's ankle diameter against their knee diameter. Maybe it's a group of students, they've been asked to measure their own ankles and knees. And this is what you get. First of all, you can see that most of the data is grouped around what looks like a fairly consistent trend. But there are a few points that are situated outside of this. So there's a data point here. This one's a bit different. It's uh, lying on the same sort of trend as the other data, um, but it is quite a different ankle measurement. So it's one that you might think about and uh, think whether that is uh, what you want within your study, um, but it appears to be uh, in line with the other ones. Uh, and the two that are particularly notable are these two because the ankle diameter is very much within the range studied, but the knee diameter is very different. So samples like this might be outliers. What we want is a consistent uh, method for identifying possible outliers. And then we want to be able to think about whether we need to include those in our further analysis or whether they are indeed um, erroneous and not to be included. So first of all, just take the definition of this. So a common definition is to say that an outlier is something that is more than 1.5 times the interquartile range from either the upper or lower quartiles. So the interquartile range was this amount here, 50 megapascals. Uh, this is the upper quartile, so 1.5 times 50 is 75. So if we're more than 75 megapascals above this value, then it would be an outlier. So we can see that. The lower limit, 765. Well, our lowest value is more than 765 megapascals, so this isn't an outlier by that definition. However, the upper limit, 965 pascals, this data point here would be an outlier. So it's uh, highlighted as a data point that uh, 
might be an anomaly. What does that mean? Well, first of all, we've identified it, so we can make a note of that. You then decide whether or not you want to include it in your future analysis. So you need to go back to the experiment or from where that data came and check. Check, did anything happen that you didn't expect? Was the experiment faulty in some way? Was the sample different from the others in some way? And you might well find that there was a reason why, a valid reason why you can uh, take that data out of the rest of the sample. If you can't find a reason why, then it's best practice to keep it within the sample, keep it within your analysis, uh, and keep a track of it and see how much it's influencing things. It's of course statistically possible that you get a value like that, um, which uh, was a genuine um, sample point, which the experiment behaved right and the material was right, um, but it's a flag that it could be uh, something to look at further. Okay, we've finished our first mini lecture. We've taken a set of data, we've thought about the fact that we're trying to measure something, there's an idea that there's an average value that we'd like to know for what the material is um, and how that might change from sample to sample that we're likely to receive and then we've recognized that we've got the sample of data that we've actually measured uh, and those are two different things, the sample is different from the population it's come from. With the sample that we've got we thought well this sample um, is uh, uh, one particular sample and the next will be different. The middle value, the median and the range give us a picture of that but the interquartile range starts to take account of the fact that each sample is going to be different but the IQR is going to be more consistent from one batch to the next and then we've looked at outliers to identify those and then consider whether we need to include them in future analysis. The next late lecture will take this on to the next step and come up with some simple ideas for modeling data. First of all we'll look at histograms and see how we can take one particular data set and start to put it into a representation that is more general, more generic. And then we'll see how the normal distribution can be used in many cases to provide a first model for that data. Thank you very much.